C'est moi. <laughs> That's a funny one. Nothing personal word of the day. C'est moi. That means it's me. That's actually three words in French, two words in English, unless it is me. That's three words. C'est moi, as in it's me. Now, what am I talking about? This is the time when it would be amazing if people would say, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to deal with this issue. I'm going to make it so we can help someone else. Well, no one's saying that because I'm looking out my window and guess what I see? I see a bunch of cruise ships. I thought they were empty. It turns out some of the cruise ships are not empty. They've got sick passengers on them, a few dead passengers, a few healthy passengers, and no one will let them dock and get the passengers off the ship. I sort of understand the issues, obviously. We've got health care crisis in Florida, shortage of beds everywhere. But at some point, you stand up and you say, say moi. And the good news is, is that it is breaking news that there is a deal being made right now where Broward County, literally outside my window, they will let this ship dock and is a Holland America ship, and they will get people off and quote unquote, whisk them away. But the point is this, when you have a chance to say, say moi, it's way better than saying, say toi, or say vous. That's, it's you, that's French. The reason why you wanna always say, say moi, is you wanna take the bull by the horns, be in control, make the difference, be the difference. For whatever reason, not enough people are saying it, some people are. I ordered Anthony's coal fire pizza last night. I ate too much, but someone got free pizza. Remember that from yesterday, loyal, nothing personal listeners. Hey, thanks for downloading and subscribing. Don't forget this weekend, you're getting the bonus pod questions that you asked while you rated and reviewed and you asked a question in your review on Apple. I'm gonna answer those in a pod this Saturday. That's the March episode. I appreciate you subscribing to this, good stories. I guess people like the Jamie Foxx story, among others. I appreciate it. But tell a friend, not but, and. So we, got, we spent a lot of time on this show, and I'm going to keep spending time because I can't stop. A lot of time on the Astros, a lot of time on the trash can banging scandal, a lot of time talking about Jim Crane's apology press conference and what an absolute horrific nightmare that was from a sports standpoint, from a business standpoint, not from a life standpoint. And we also talked about the lawsuits that were being filed. And I told you that from a legal standpoint, there is no ground to stand on. Former player Mike Bolsinger is suing the Astros saying, hey, you bang trash cans and I couldn't become and stay a major leaguer. By the way, I told you he stunk. The Astros had nothing to do with the fact he had a bad career. Fantasy players are suing the Astros and MLB. You've heard me talk about that. How could I win fantasy when there's cheating going on? We've talked about what the legal documents have said and what teams are saying. But yesterday it happened. It was awesome. It was as though Jim Crane said, you know what? I feel for you, David. I want you to have something awesome to talk about on your Nothing Personal segment show today, Thursday, April something, April 2nd. Am I the only one who doesn't know the day of the week? I used to not know it, but now I really don't know it. It's almost, I learned an expression from my father who after he retired, he said that he had six Fridays. Sorry, I blew the whole joke. Isn't that amazing when you blow a joke? His life, he doesn't know what day it is because his life is six Saturdays and a Sunday. Get that, right, when you're retired? Although he still works, so that whole thing was a little weird to me. But in any case, during this quarantine and social distancing and everyone is staying home and being safe and trying to flatten the curve, there's no question that days sort of get lost. I know what Wednesday is because of Survivor. I know what Tuesday is because of Shit's Creek, though next Tuesday is the last one. Other than that, I sort of have no sort of gauge as to what day it is. It feels like a Friday a little bit to me. But in any case, we're here Monday through Friday. Jim Crane said that you got a show. I'm going to give you something. It's going to be so good. And here it is. 
Jim Crane, through his lawyers, in a document filed that is a public document in a public proceeding, said, I have no legal liability to you, Mike Bolsinger, because I, Jim Crane, have been exonerated by Major League Baseball in the sign-stealing scandal. I had nothing to do with this. I tweeted about it right after because I couldn't wait, right? I, 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 I literally couldn't wait to get out there my view, which is that is not a legal argument. So what I want to start with now is the concept of the power of Major League Baseball the omniscient view that I used to have by being in Major League Baseball, how above everything I was, how excited I was to be in that exclusive group of owners and presidents and players, and how rules may or may not apply. I'm not saying that I broke the law ever, mind you. What I am saying is it's a feeling you get. It's a feeling of invincibility. It's a feeling of you'll never get fired. It's a feeling of you won't lose a game. It's a feeling of that you're making every move that's right. It's a feeling that you are making a difference in so many lives often on the field. The power of sending a player to the minor leagues or calling a player up and having his first big league game. The life-changing things that you can do when you get a fan to meet a player all of the things that you can do when you are president of a team, it can tend to it can tend to make your ego outsized. I've never been accused of having a small ego, but I can promise you that my ego grew over 18 years. Anyone who tells you their ego didn't is lying. Anyone in baseball or media who tells you that their ego isn't fed through Twitter and through social media and through the power of knowledge of knowing things that other people want to know. That's actually the basis of all sources of information when people leak stuff to the media because they want everyone to know in that media that they, hey, I know something that you want to know. Jim Crane saying that he was exonerated by MLB and that matters is a function of what it feels like to be in MLB. The feeling that everything you do matters and that it's got legal weight. I've got a surprise for you, Jim Crane. MLB has zero legal authority of any kind. Zero. They have no power of subpoena. They have no power to incarcerate. They have no power to charge. They have no power to file other than as a civil litigant. That's all MLB can do. They can do exactly what you and I can do. They can file a lawsuit against someone else to get money, to give money when they've been wronged, when they've been righted. Anything that anybody can do who's a civilian, they're not part of the government. MLB's Department of Investigations is one of the best departments in all of sports. In some cases, it's better than police departments, not all, but some. In some cases, it's better than some detectives, not every case, but some. As was painfully and almost uh, insultingly depicted in the movie Screwball by Billy Corbin, it's possible that some members of the Department of Investigations back in the day were not exactly perfect. But I would put the MLB Department of Investigations above just about anybody. If there's something to find out, they're going to find it out. But guess who the Department of Investigations reports to? The commissioner. And we talked about on Nothing Personal that if the commissioner had found that Jim Crane known or should have known, he would have had to punish Jim Crane in a way that would have made other owners uncomfortable. And Rob Manford reports to 30 owners and needs 23 of them to agree with what he's doing, not 30, 23. I told you on nothing personal, I'm going to say it again. If you think for one second that Jim Crane did not know what was going on with banging of trash cans, stealing of signs and putting monitors in the dugout and cameras in center field, you are delusional. Of course, Jim Crane knew. I don't care how uninvolved your owner is. They're going to know when there's trash can banging in the dugout. They're going to speak or hear about it. Oh, if they don't, they should have because they're in charge. So for Jim Crane to say that he was completely exonerated is absolutely absurd. But what's more, 
By the way, that was a call out to Charles Emerson Winchester for all of you fans of MASH. He was a guy from Massachusetts, and he would talk like that. It's absurd. He was very sort of hoity-toity and hoi polloi ish None of those things I want to be. And I just, um, by the way, hoi polloi is not hoity-toity. I believe that hoi polloi, Coke is going to check this, but he don't, won't know how to spell hoi polloi. I believe that hoi polloi is an antonym of hoity-doity, heidi-tidy. Is it heidi-tidy? Howdy, howdy? howdy? And it's the hoity howdy towdy. I'm so bad at pronouncing names. Wait till I get to the fact that I have to pronounce Clowney's first name in the wait to see because I rehearsed it with Coca and I absolutely forgot how to say it, but I do know who whispered in my ear. So Jim Crane 100% knew, should have known, exonerated. Who cares? That is not a legal principle. MLB cannot legally exonerate Jim Crane, yet his lawyers went ahead and said, hey, hey, Exonerated. You can't sue me over this. Now, I happen to believe the lawsuit that is being filed against the Astros is completely without merit in every possible way. Why? Because there is no way that any game, any performance was switched enough to alter a career. Bring it on. Let me hear it. Go ahead. Give me the argument. I've had this argument with former players, current players. Give it to me. Yeah, I know you wish you would have known what the signs were you would have hit better. Yes, I know that you wish when you were pitching, the Astros didn't know your signs because then you may have not gotten shelled. Why are we not hearing from the pitchers who didn't get shelled while the Astros were stealing the same signs? We know why Mike Bolsinger is not in the major leagues. He wasn't in the major leagues because he wasn't good enough. Period, end of sentence. So for Jim Crane, my final message on this don't let a lawyer file a briefing. We saw it with the Olympics. The head, not the Olympics, the, um, the soccer federation. Do you know we said that the head of FIFA resigned because of a legal document that he claims he did not read? And if I say FIFA one more time when it's FIFA, then Coke is literally going to blow an eardrum. It is the head of FIFA resigned because he did not read a legal document and then had to take the fall for what it said. Jim Crane is going to tell you he didn't read any of these legal documents. Well, I filed about a lot of legal documents because a lot of people like suing the Marlins and everything associated with the Marlins. And I've been a part of just about every one of them as witness or as president of a team. And I've watched read. There is not a filing that will ever be filed that I will not read. And if I haven't read it, if it says something that it shouldn't have said, it is my fault, period, end of story, hard stop. Jim Crane hiding behind the MLB Department of Investigations saying that they exonerated me so we're good. It's an outrage. But I'm moving more quick Astros thing. AJ Hinch and Jeff Luna, you'll be pleased to know that the general manager and manager of the Astros, their full year long suspensions will be fulfilled even without a full 2020 season. I'm sorry. I can hear it. Say it again. One little more time. Hold on. What? No, yes. I don't care either. I know. But, but I just want people to know in case you're going to hire Jeff Lunau again, which you're not, or A.J. Hinch is getting another job as manager, which he's not, that they'd be eligible to be reinstated and their suspension's over after 2020, no matter how many games are played. Thank you very much. You know, we don't often hear players talk about players. It's one of the things that um, I have a uh, – the process of nothing personal, I want to let you in a little bit on it. You, you've heard about it. You know a bit about it. The process is that I go through and I come up with ideas and segments. And then Coke and I have a conversation. He sends segments that interest him. I send segments to him that interest me. We come up with a list that interests we and that we are interested in. Get it. And then we do the show, a rundown, but it just has minutes. So r right now I'm going to talk about this subject for approximately five minutes, but I never really stick to it. And that's how Coke is in my ears saying, hey, move on, land the plane, on to the next, or keep going, this is great. One thing that I hesitate is talking about when what goes on inside a clubhouse, the personal things that go on inside a clubhouse. Because 
I believe in the sanctity of the clubhouse. I believe that what happens in the clubhouse stays in the clubhouse. I've told you general stories that impact me because I'm happy to share them. I'm happy to give you insight into things that I've experienced in the clubhouse, sometimes with names, sometimes without. I've always questioned when players talk about each other in public. As a president of a team, 20 times, I was 18 years, at least once a year, I was in the clubhouse telling the players, listen, why would you say this publicly? He's right here 10 feet from you. Sit him down and tell him what you're thinking. You're upset with the manager, talk to the manager. You're upset with your teammate, talk to your teammate. Why do you have to tell the media that you're upset with a teammate? That goes for everything. If you have an issue, don't let it fester, confront it. Well, Joe Kelly is a pitcher who played for the Red Sox and now plays for the Dodgers. Mookie Betts is a player who played for the Red Sox, got traded for the Dodgers. We covered this little covered issue and we had fun doing it when Mookie Betts gave a speech to the Dodgers clubhouse as a first year, first spring training player who has a one year deal. He took the bull by the horns and gave a speech. And I told you about my discomfort with that speech. I told you, I didn't think that that was a great thing for a clubhouse. Well, here we are about a month later in the middle of a delay of spring training, potentially a delay, definitely a delay and maybe a cancellation of the season. And Joe Kelly, for whatever reason, went to the media and told them that during the Mookie Bet speech, there were times that it was cringeworthy. He was cringing at times and so were other teammates. If you're Joe Kelly, what's the reason? If you're Stan Cast and the president of the Dodgers, you are calling up Joe Kelly right now. You are telling Joe Kelly that that is a mistake and that he needs to call Mookie Betts. You're calling Mookie Betts and you're Zooming him and making sure that he and Joe are on the same page. Because no matter what provisos Joe Kelly said after his comments, and there were many, including, including a proviso, it was a good speech, including a proviso, it was meaningful, including a proviso that it was received well including a proviso that while it may have been strange for a first year player in spring training for the first time to give a speech like this to a team that had won six straight division titles or seven that had won a hundred games two out of the last three years, been to the world series two out of the last three years, including all those provisos, he still said it was cringeworthy. And he said, because Mookie Betts may not have been able to articulate clearly enough what he was trying to say, but most of us got his point. Hey, Joe, let me try to articulate this point to you. When you say things about a player, about the way they articulate, the things in which they say and the way in which they say it, you are risking being misinterpreted, not just on an English basis, on a racial basis, on a teammate basis, on a front office basis, and on an opposing team basis. Those are all the risks that are inherent with the things you said. And the reason I know this is that I myself have fallen victim to saying things when we, listen, I talk for a living. I've talked for a living since I was in grade school, literally. So the question is, will there be times that I'll go over the line? Yeah. Will there be times that I'll be punished if I'm doing nothing personal, when I'm doing nothing personal for decades to come? Yeah. That said... I'm going to make sure that I do my best, that I know when I'm crossing the line, and it is a risk that I'm taking purposefully. I got the feeling Joe Kelly did not understand the significance of the comments he made. I give him a pass. I give him a pass for the subject matter that he chose to talk about. What I don't give him a pass for is violating the clubhouse rule that I tried so hard to instill in the players, in the front office. Leave it in the clubhouse. Hey, who's watching Dodger games today? Anybody? Bueller. Who gets this joke? Coca, you better tell me you get it. Bueller? Bueller, you're watching the Dodgers? Yes, indeed you are, Walker. Yes, indeed you are. For the first time in seven years. Los Angeles Dodgers games will be available to everybody who lives in Los Angeles. 
it was just announced late yesterday. If you don't live in LA, let me tell you a story. The way it works is, you see, that there's a deal that teams make with cable companies. The teams make the content, the cable companies distribute that content, and you, the viewers, watch the content. You pay the cable company, the cable company pays the team, the team pays the players and themselves. The cable company takes your money, pays the team and themselves. You take your hard-earned money and give it in order to watch the games. Are we clear? That's how it works. It's not the end of the world. I do it all the time. Every time I go into a movie theater, I'm paying to be a movie. I'm not getting any money from it. I'm not getting anything but enjoyment. That's called entertainment. You are getting entertained by Dodgers games. Well, there was a 20... ...in 2013 in the Dodgers and Time Warner Cable. Let me give all those numbers again. 25 years, 8.35 billion dollars. Couldn't have been more jealous when that deal got signed. I knew that I was going to start negotiating my own TV deal, and I just wanted to try to get to $1 billion. The thought of getting to $8.35 billion, it's a pipe dream. You know why. As a matter of fact, I'm going to cover it on this weekend's bonus pod. You know why certain markets get more for their TV revenue why the Dodgers are able to have a bigger payroll than the Marlins. We'll talk all about it. However, what am I missing? The Dodgers got paid $8.35 billion divided by 25 years. Wait, yeah, you couldn't watch the games. Time Warner Cable was unable to do a deal with anybody on any of the now what are called AT&T platforms like DirecTV. Time Warner Cable, it became Sportsnet LA. The way it works is Sportsnet LA charges cable carriers to get their station's content. Time Warner was charging so much money that AT&T said pound sand. Time Warner wanted each of you subscribers to pay $20 a month for the right to watch Dodger games. And by the way, wanted everyone who didn't watch Dodger games in the LA area to pay that same $21 a month, let's say, for that network. And they were told no. They were told that there's no way we are paying you that much for Dodger games. And Time Warner said, no problem. We're not going to sell it to you. We cannot afford to sell you these games for a smaller amount of money because we will have no way to make this deal work with the amount that we paid the Dodgers. Why didn't the Dodgers care that they watch Vin Scully's last year? Why didn't the Dodgers care that there was no one watching their games? Not the big number of people who should have. They were all blocked out. Why didn't they care? Wait for it. They were getting paid. Well, it turns out that the blackout ended. Ironically, there's no baseball to be watched. Why would it be blocked out now? Why would it be, why would the blackout end now? Because what turns out that when everyone's quarantined, there is now a risk, a very real risk to the Dodgers that games will be played without fans. They'll lose their gait and more fans will want to and need to watch on TV. There's a danger to the Dodgers that if there aren't 81 games this season or 100 home games or 150 games available to give to Time Warner, they'll have to do make goods and not get their entire rights fee deal. There is a financial incentive for the Dodgers to get involved now. When the Dodgers come out and tell you they had nothing to do with it, they did not get involved in this blackout. They were not involved in the settlement. When you read an article that says the Dodgers were not involved in any settlement related to the cable company who owns their rights and the carriers of that cable channel, they are lying to you. And the reason they're lying to you is, of course, they have to get involved. I got involved in every single thing that went on between Fox and any of its dis distribution channels. I didn't do the negotiating. I couldn't tell Fox what to charge for Fox Sports Florida. But if there were a blackout in our area, you think I wouldn't be aware of it? 
whenever there was a carriage dispute, those little crawls you see on the bottom of your channel sometime, this is a carriage dispute between CBS and blank. And please call your cable provider and say that you want Fox Sports Florida. You've seen those crawls. You think as a provider of content to Fox Sports Florida, I wouldn't get involved in that? It's absurd. Of course I would get involved in that. That's the story of the Dodgers blackout. <sighs> I got to tell you quick. You know what? I'm, I was just, I, I'm doing it. Coke, I'm doing it. I'm pulling an audible here. I, um, I spent so much time in Los Angeles with Fox I was renegotiating a Fox television deal with people in Fox and I wasn't doing it with Fox Sports Florida people. I was doing it with Fox in Los Angeles people, the people in charge of all regional networks. And I went out to LA almost once a month for several years and uh, one or two years negotiating what I wanted to be an extension to a current deal because back in 2005, I had to do a TV deal that I was embarrassed about. And the reason I had to do a deal in 2005 that I was embarrassed about is that's two years after we won the World Series in 2003. And back then it was not Fox Sports, it was Cablevision. I don't know if you, any of you remember Cablevision, those of you on the East Coast may. But I had to go with my tail between my legs in 2005 and say the following, hey, I need money. And here's why. We won the World Series in 2003, but we have no revenue. We're not attracting fans. We have no ballpark. I have failed at getting a new ballpark, which I promised the owner after we won the World Series would open in 2006. It turned out I was six years in arrears. I promised the owner after we won the World Series in 03 that we'd have more revenue, more season ticket holders, more local revenue, more sponsorship revenue. I failed in every way possible in that way. We had to let Pudge go, trade Derek Lee, 2004. Comes 2005, I'm telling him, hey, we may get a ballpark. Let's try to win in 05. We've got this core of the team together from the 03 series. Let's go for it all, all in. Carlos Delgado is a free agent. Let's get him. Let's sign him to a totally backloaded deal. Only have to pay him $8 million this year. But we need to raise cash because we are going to lose $30 million. And I'm not asking you to write a full $30 million to check, Mr. Loria, the owner of the team. What is the maximum amount of check you will write? I was told the maximum and it was substantial, but I had to come up with the rest of the cash. So I go to Cablevision. And this is a story that ends and starts with leverage. Leverage is what happens when you need something so badly that you can't leave without saying yes. Leverage is something that exists when you're in the middle of a negotiation and you know, forget having a leg to stand on, you don't have a toe, nail. I sat down at Cablevision. This was gonna be a Fox story from the most recent times, but it ended up being a 2005 story, which shows you that we're not rehearsed here. This is a story of what happened in 2005, walked into an office and said, listen, I'm willing to give you an extension, a 15 year extension to the current deal. You can lock up the Marlins through 2020, but we need money up front right now, cash, cash dollars that we can use toward payroll and paying down some debt. Right now we need it. Cablevision said, wow. You're desperate. I couldn't go to the banks. I couldn't go to venture capitalists. There was nowhere else to get cash. I walked into a meeting knowing very well that I had very little chance of having a positive result. What I didn't realize, and I wasn't smart enough to realize back then, sadly, is that by giving them the amount of years they needed to get that money, I was keeping a team together for a year that we ended up having to break up in one year. And I was putting us at a competitive disadvantage for years to come. The TV deal that I signed then is only up at the end of this season, 15 years. When we had higher payrolls going through the stadium starting in 2012, various other years, it meant annual losses. Not every year, but the, when, we, when we were not after tearing the team down or trading away players and starting again, rebuilding, those years were years that we lost money. And our TV revenue lagged so far behind, it was unconscionable. The current TV revenue for the Marlins is unconscionably low, and it's my fault. But I did give the new owners a chance to get more, and they said, eh, we'll do better. That's a story for another time. That's my Cablevision story, Coke. It's not a Fox story. I just wanted to tell a Cablevision story. <sighs> so you want to talk to Samson. 
Thank you for telling a friend about nothing personal. Thank you for the questions that keep coming in. You're following me at David P. Sampson. Please tell your friends to subscribe to the show, follow me on Twitter, get into my DMs and ask me questions. This was one that uh, the minute I saw it, the minute I saw it, you had me. And I'm going to give you an honest answer that you're going to not be surprised to hear me say it. You're going to be surprised to hear that everyone else does it but doesn't say it. Do players and teams in Major League Baseball pay attention to stats that are not part of salary negotiations? And what stat was the most important to me as a team president? All right, that's a good one. All right, let me start. Do players and teams in MLB pay attention to stats that are not part of salary negotiations? No. We don't care about any stat that will not aid us in doing one of two things. On the baseball side, you've got scouts and you've got GMs who focus on stats that help them project what a player can do. Me, on the business side of the baseball and regular business, I don't focus on anything but stats that are part of salary negotiations. So when I'm sitting down and negotiating a salary, one of the number one stats, there are two primary number one stats during any salary negotiation. One, how many days of service do you have in baseball? Two, how many years do you have on earth? Age, service time. The next stat I look at is DL time. What kind of injury history does this player have? Has he had one Tommy John? It's more likely to have another. Does he have shoulder issues? Does he end up sitting out more time for a hamstring than other players? What about a grade two, grade three, calf strain, bicep strain, hamstring strain, back injury, front injury, eye injury? I'm not talking about physical errors when a ball goes through your legs. I'm not talking about strikeout to walk ratio. I'm not talking about average, batting average, war, runners in scoring position. I'm not talking about home runs, doubles, triples. I've got baseball people to do that. I pay attention to the stats that matter when it comes to what players get paid for. And in salary arbitration, you get paid for home runs, RBIs, bulk, meaning how much of something do you have? As a get paid depending on your age, we think you will do and a combination of what you have done. We do a math equation. What kind of business will you lead to? Is there any way to excuse any part of a salary paid to a player based on any incremental business we'll get? Go through it all. Every possible way to look at a salary to go. And what are players? Players are not comparing stats at all, actually. When players negotiate with you, do you know all they're looking at is what other players make? And then they have the view that they are better than those other players or worse than those other players. So that's where their salary should fit in. They get their agents to prepare presentations. I've seen 200 page presentations that right now, right now, during this period of time, they would be in my bathroom probably sell it on eBay. There's such a shortage. That's what they're worth. Team presentations, player presentations by agents given to teams are worth literally not the printer they're printed, paper they're printed on. We don't pay attention to any of the stuff that is written by agents about players. Why? Because we have what we do purposefully. What stat was the most important to me when I was team president? It was whether or not a player would agree to the number we wanted so that that player would be at least marked to market. I want to explain what marked to market is. Marked to market is if a player's making a million dollars, is he giving you a million dollars worth of production or is he giving you more or is he giving you less? A player perfectly marked to market is a player who is getting paid exactly what he is providing. An example, if you are paying Christian Yelich $12 million, 
he is not mark to market because he is worth $30 million to your team. If you're paying Albert Pujols $25 million, he's not mark to market because he's worth $2.50 on your team. So you go through and do that analysis and you need as many players as you can to be outperforming their contracts, to be not mark to market, but on the upside for you, not for them. You need 15 Yelichs if you're the Brewers or the Marlins. You can afford to have one or two Pujols if you're the Dodgers or the Angels. You put a Pujols on the Marlins, you got yourself a problem, and his name is Chen. I appreciate the question, so you want to talk to Samson. Day 18. It is day 18. Yes, it is. Day 18 of the ML Beard Challenge. I'm growing a beard. I went on the uh, Levitard show, local hour today, and uh, my beard was made fun of by Mike Ryan. I don't understand why. I'll post another. I've got a beard already. Coca, meanwhile, only grows hair in about 48% of his face of eligible facial. I'm not counting your forehead, Coca. I'm not counting your ears. <laughs> Sorry, that was another lack of cough button. <laughs> Coca, can you please tell me, did you actually hear that? Because if you did, I apologize. Okay. He, he just said he heard that. So that means I have to apologize to the audience. I don't know what that was. It may have been a small vermerp, or as I used to call it, a greps, which is Yiddish for burp. In any case. So I do have a beard. It's only day 18. $1,000 a day to every major league team. Yesterday was the Mets. What do you think today is? Yes, the New York Yankees Foundation will get $1,000 for them to distribute to day of game workers or anyone they see fit who needs any amount of help because of coronavirus. Please go to their website, find their foundation, donate money if you're in New York because you, have, you are in the hardest hit area in the country right now. Hospital workers need food, they need help. People need food, they need clothing, they need masks, they need supplies. The Yankees are being helpful. The Mets are being helpful. And it, the way to be helpful is through their foundation, which will find ways to get the right people the money. If you're a Yankee fan, you know very well that uh, this coronavirus pandemic and delay of the season could not have come at a worse, better time. The delay in the season could not have come at a worse, better, better, worse time. Am I being subliminal, man, Kevin Nealon? That's Saturday Night Live reference. No. I'm telling you, the Yankees are in a position where they are both secretly happy and quietly despondent that the season is starting late. Let's start with why they're happy. They're happy because Giancarlo Stanton will be ready for opening day. Aaron Judge will be ready for opening day. James Paxton will be ready for opening day. Luis Severino is only going to miss half a season instead of a full season. All the injuries they had to start the season, all the trouble they were having, it's going to go away. That's a positive. Luis Severino, they don't have to pay him while he's rehabbing from Tommy John because while he's not getting paid his salary, you can bet your last dollar that he's still going to go through the rehab and be ready as soon as he can, which won't be for all of next year, in my opinion. Could be maybe after the All-Star break of 2021. Why are they unhappy, though? Because they signed Garrett Cole to nine years. This was a critical year for Garrett Cole. $324 million or whatever it was, 345 over nine, 324 over nine. I can't remember what it is. Garrett Cole is getting 30 plus million dollars, but the Yankees don't have to pay him. But what they don't have is they don't have Cole pitching for them over 162 game season, where having an ace like that is a difference maker in terms of their percentage chance of winning the division, getting into the playoffs and winning the World Series. A shortened season levels the playing field in the American League East. It gives the Rays an even better chance than they had of winning that division. It even makes the Blue Jays a little more dangerous. It does nothing for the Orioles. For the Red Sox, I could argue that it could make them a little better, but not, not better enough that they will be able to compete with the Yankees. But the amazing advantage they had is what they earned and would have earned through a 162-game season. That's why they're unhappy. Will they have a year of players further down the line on their deals? 
Aaron Hicks will be recovered. That's important. Not paying players who aren't performing is worse than when not, you're not paying players because there are no games. The gate revenue they'll lose is significant. The economic impact to the Yankees is significant. But on the field, my point of on the field is that it's mixed. And when you're running a team, I would make lists when I was president of the team. I would actually literally do a, what was the name of the character in Along Came Polly? It was sort of a nerdy name, and I can't remember what. It was played by Ben Stiller. It's one of my favorite movies. I absolutely love it with Hank Azari and Jennifer Aniston and uh, the girl from uh, uh, Will and Grace, whose name escapes me. In any case, uh, um, uh, Ruben. Thank you. Ruben Pfeffer was the name. Thank you, Coca. Um, it's funny. I know exactly how fast his Google works, right, when I get those answers. Unless, of course, he may have known Ruben Pfeffer. Philip Seymour Hoffman, he's reminding me, he was in the movie, who unfortunately has passed away. He's phenomenal in that movie. He's the one who was having an E! True Hollywood story filmed by him about him. In any case, I have no idea why I was even mentioning Along Came Polly. I literally have no idea why that was in my mind. Was I telling a story? It's, this, is, this is it. It's happened. We are here on Friday, April 5th or whatever day today is. And this is the first time. It's Thursday. <laughs> today is Thursday. I got into a story about a long came Polly, and I cannot find my way back. I can't land the plane. It's the Yankees. It was the beer challenge. Coca has no idea. I have no idea. Tweet at me at David P. Sampson if you do. The bottom line is I'm going into one quick thing to tell you, and that is I wasted, wasted, and I mean wasted, 108 minutes of my life yesterday and $19.99. And you are going to say thank you when I tell you that you're not going to see the way back with Ben Affleck. You are not going to spend the $19.99 to have theater at home no matter how long you're quarantined because you're going to go back and you're going to watch Hoosiers with Gene Hackman. You're going to watch Rudy or Remember the Titans. You're going to watch any, any number for the love of the game, any number of sports movies that are phenomenal. It turns out that The Way Back is absolutely not a sports story. This is an auto biographical story of Ben Affleck's life. This is a story that basically was Ben Affleck apologizing to his ex-wife, Jennifer Garner, for his substance abuse. We work with a guy named John. I've actually never had to call him by his last name, but I, it's spelled Demusio, but I don't know if it's pronounced that way. John is a phenomenally talented producer. I don't know if you call him a technical producer, a digital producer, a associate producer, a director, whatever he does. It's hard to do shows without him. And he's this amazing fountain of knowledge. He loves talking movies and sports with me. For whatever reason, I got word that he thought The Way Back was actually a good movie. The problem with you, John, saying that is you've got some influence over people who watch movies. They are going to watch this movie. They will then never listen to you again. You've got to maintain credibility with your listeners and your followers. I am telling you now the way back is not worth the $20 you have to spend. And if you're getting it for free on some stolen website or wherever, if you're, whatever you're doing, it's not worth the time of your day. Your time is worth more than that. Ben Affleck plays a down in his luck. Now, they did add a tragic part to this movie. No doubt. It's not a true story. This is a tragic part to the movie. It may explain certain of the reasons why. He has some of the afflictions he has, makes it maybe a little more dramatic, tries to get the tear ducts flowing. He then becomes a coach. The team goes from crap to great. He has these great moments. He reenacts a scene from Boiler Room when he tries to um, motivate people to sell stocks, motivating his players to be good. I didn't buy any of it. I didn't understand any of what they were trying to do. I didn't cry. I didn't laugh. I rolled my eyes and I texted Coke in the middle saying, give me my 108 minutes back. And then I got to thinking the business side of it. 
How does a movie like this get made? It gets made because you have Ben Affleck. How does it get edited and released? Because you've got the star power of Ben Affleck. But aren't there executives who are watching? Aren't there executives who are development executives who look at that and say, ew, it's terrible. Yeah, they may. But you know what happens after that? One of the other executives walks in and says, hey, listen, it may not be good, but I'll tell you one thing, it's going to make money. And at the end of the day, Ben Affleck, you know what that means. It's just business. It's nothing personal.